Ever have one of those, ha, huh, that's so random moments? Mm -hmm. Like imagine you're a kid about to go on a school trip. Okay. You're psyched, right? Yeah. And your mom tells the teacher, make sure they learn about the Buddha. Right. What if that seemingly random request sure. was actually the start of an epic adventure? I like it. That's the vibe of this deep dive. We're going back 2,500 years okay. to ancient India, All right. a time of massive change. Yeah. Kingdoms exploding inside cities are buzzing. It's like the human experience on fast forward. And people were grappling with some seriously big questions about yeah. life, death. Of course. And the whole shebang. Makes sense. And out of this pressure cooker emerge some of history's most influential philosophies. Buddhism, Jainism, the Upanishads, mm. all trying to make sense of a world in flux. Yeah. Our guidebook for this journey, what? excerpts from a textbook section called New Questions and Ideas, <laughs> which... Which is perfect. Okay. Because that's exactly what these philosophies represent. Okay. New ways of thinking, new answers, or at least new ways to ask the questions to life's big mysteries. So let's dive into the first of these groundbreaking philosophies, Buddhism. Okay. And, of course, no talk about Buddhism would be complete without mentioning its founder, right. Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha himself. Of course, yeah. Yeah, we've all heard the story. Privileged prince walks away from it all, seeking enlightenment. Right. But what's really fascinating is how his teachings yeah. were a direct response to the anxieties of his time. Yeah. It's like he was offering a toolkit okay. for navigating uncertainty. Right. Something people were craving in that era of rapid change. Yeah. Think about it. Political upheaval, yeah. social shifts, for sure. the ever-present realities of sickness and death. It's a recipe for existential angst. Yeah, and into this climate of unease steps the Buddha. Right. Not as a god or a prophet, but right. as a guide. He's yeah. like, hey, uh -huh. I get it. Life's tough. Let's figure this out together. And that's a crucial point. Yeah. He wasn't about blind faith. Right. He encouraged critical thinking, questioning everything. Yeah. And he used everyday language, Prakrit. Right. So everyone, not just the elite, could access his teachings. Like he was the people's philosopher. There you go. Right. And one of the most powerful examples of his teachings is the parable of Kisagotami and the mustard seeds. Oh, yeah, yeah. Talk about a story that stays with you. It's heartbreaking. It is. But also incredibly profound. Yeah. It perfectly illustrates the Buddha's teachings on the universality of suffering and the impermanence of life. So Kisagotami, she's a grieving mother right. who lost her child. Right. She goes to the Buddha desperate for a miracle, uh, hoping he can bring her son back. Right. It's every parent's worst nightmare. It is. And the Buddha, instead of offering empty platitudes, yeah. gives her a seemingly impossible task. Right. He tells her to find a house where no one has ever died. Right. And bring back a handful of mustard seeds. Wow, yeah. It's brilliant, really. It is. He's forcing her to confront the one truth we all try to avoid. Right. Death is inevitable. Exactly. Kisa Gotami goes door to door, uh -huh. her hope dwindling with each step yeah. until she realizes death is an inescapable part of life. Yeah. It's a gut wrenching no, yeah. but necessary lesson right. wrapped in a story anyone can understand. Right. And that accessibility was key to the Buddha's teachings. Yeah. He met people where they were, using stories and parables to illustrate complex truths. And this idea of seeking deeper meaning wasn't confined to Buddhism. Right. At the same time, you have the emergence of the Upanishads. The Upanishads. These incredible collections of texts that read like intimate conversations between <laughs> teachers and students exploring the very fabric of reality. Yeah, the Upanishads are where things get really meta. They do. We're talking about the nature of the self. Yeah. The universe yeah. and the connection between the two. Right. It's heady stuff. Definitely heady. Right. But also incredibly insightful. Yeah. One of the key concepts is this idea of Atman and Brahman. Okay. Atman being the individual soul okay. and Brahman being the universal soul, the ultimate reality. So two separate entities. That's where it gets wild. Okay. The Upanishads propose that Atman and Brahman are not separate. Okay. But ultimately one and the same. Okay. We're not separate from the universe. Okay. But a part of its very essence. Yes. Yeah. Whoa, okay, we're all connected, man. Like, right. It's like that moment in a movie where the hero realizes they're part of something much bigger than they ever imagined. Exactly. And this realization, this understanding of our interconnectedness 
is a path to liberation. Okay. To transcending our limited sense of self. Right. And experiencing a higher truth. Okay. So we're talking about understanding our place in the cosmos. Right. Not just finding peace in a chaotic world. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But was this wisdom available to uh, everyone? That's what's so interesting. Okay. The Upanishads feature stories of individuals breaking social barriers to attain knowledge. Okay. Like the story of Satyakaka Kamajabala. Okay. The son of a slave woman who becomes a renowned scholar. Right. He proves that wisdom and enlightenment aren't bound by social status. There you go. Yeah. It's a powerful message. It is a powerful message. It is. And it speaks to a deeper current flowing through this era. Okay. A yearning for knowledge, yeah. for something more. Right. That transcended the rigid social structures of the time. It's like a quiet revolution brewing in the hearts and minds of ancient India. I like it. But this theme of challenging the status quo gets even more intense with our next philosophy, Jainism. So we've explored the world of Buddhism with its emphasis on understanding and navigating suffering. Okay. Now let's shift gears to Jainism. Right. A philosophy often associated with extreme nonviolence. Sure. We're talking next level stuff here. Absolutely. Right. If Buddhism offered a middle way, a path to enlightenment while still very much a part of the world. Okay. Jainism, with Mahavira as its guiding light. Right. Took a more radical approach. Mahavira, he was like the Buddha in a way, wasn't he? Yeah. Born into a life of privilege, but ultimately renouncing it all. Their stories share some striking similarities. Okay. Both were born into royalty. Right. Both abandoned lives of comfort and ease to seek truth. Yeah. Both dedicated themselves to intense meditation and introspection. Okay. But while their paths had common threads, right. their teachings, while overlapping at times, okay. veered off in fascinating directions. And one of those fascinating, and let's be honest, pretty intense directions is the Jain principle of ahimsa, right. nonviolence. Of course, yeah. But it's not just about avoiding physical harm, right? right. We're talking about an all-encompassing respect for all life. Exactly. For Jains, Ahimsa goes way beyond just not hurting others. Right. It extends to all living creatures. Okay. No matter how tiny or seemingly insignificant, right. every life form, yes. from humans to insects, right. deserves compassion and protection. Okay, now I'm picturing those Jain monks who gave up literally everything, wow. even clothing, to avoid harming even the tiniest insect. Talk about commitment. It's a powerful testament to their beliefs. It is. They live lives of extreme simplicity and non-attachment. Yeah. Practicing celibacy. Right. Following a strict vegetarian diet. Yeah. And going to incredible lengths to avoid harming any living thing. Right. Even unintentionally. I read about Jane monks sweeping the ground as they walk to avoid stepping on insects. Yeah. It's incredible, really. It highlights the depth of their conviction. Yeah. But this level of asceticism wasn't for everyone, right. even back then. Right. Interestingly, Jainism resonated most strongly with certain groups, okay. like merchants and traders. Which makes sense, right? Yeah. Our textbook mentioned that. Was yeah. it because their line of work made it easier to adhere to Jain principles? That's a big part of it. Okay. Traders especially those involved in long-distance trade, mm -hmm. were already accustomed to self-discipline right. and a certain detachment from material possessions. Right. The principles of Jainism, yeah. like yeah. honesty, non-stealing, and non-attachment, right. align surprisingly well with their lifestyle. So it was a good fit on a practical level. It was. Right. Yeah. But let's go back to the Buddha and Mahavira for a second. Okay. They both recognize the power of community. They do. Establishing the Sanghas as gathering places for their followers. Right? Exactly. Both Buddhist and Jain Sanghas became crucial hubs for spiritual exploration and practice. Right. Think of them as vibrant communities mm -hmm. where individuals could dive deep into these new philosophical ideas, okay. supporting each other mm -hmm. on their journeys towards enlightenment or liberation. Right. Depending on their chosen path. It's like having a built-in support group for your existential quest. Precisely. And a key aspect of the Sangha was its potential for inclusivity. Okay. It didn't matter what your social standing was. Okay. In theory, everyone was welcome. Okay. It was a space where people could break free from the constraints of their social roles. Yeah. And connect on a deeper level. Because at the end of the day, we're all searching for meaning and connection. Right. We are. But I'm guessing there were some ground rules, yeah. some guidelines for joining this philosophical club. Right. Okay. Even with the best of intentions. Yeah. Human institutions come with rules. Okay. The Vinaya Pitaka, 
a Buddhist text. Okay. Outlines the do's and don'ts of Sangha life. Were there any surprising stipulations? There were some interesting ones. Okay. For instance, children needed their parents' permission to join. Oh, okay. Slaves needed their master's consent. Right. And people in debt had to settle their affairs before joining. Wow. Even back then, there was paperwork. Right. But I guess joining the Sangha was a huge life change. It was. You were basically saying goodbye to your old life. Exactly. It was a serious commitment. Yeah. Like saying, I'm all in on this spiritual path. Right. But this begs the question, where did these dedicated seekers actually live? Okay. Initially, both Buddhist and Jain monks were wanderers. Okay. Traveling from town to town. Right. Spreading their teachings. Oh. They often sought refuge in forests or caves, right. especially during the monsoon season when travel was impossible. Not the most glamorous accommodations. Definitely not five-star hotels. Right. But as these communities grew and attracted more followers, yeah. things began to change. Okay. Wealthy patrons, inspired by the teachings, okay. began to donate land and resources to build more permanent dwellings. And that's how monasteries, or viharas as they're known in India, yeah. came about. Yeah. Those incredible cave complexes carved into mountainsides. Precisely. Wow. These viharas, initially simple structures, right. evolved into impressive complexes. Yeah. Some showcasing breathtaking architectural feats. Right. And they weren't just places for monks and nuns to live. Right. They became vibrant centers of learning, attracting scholars and seekers from far and wide. So we're talking about the ancient Indian version of intellectual hotspots. Yeah. Places where ideas were debated, shared, and passed on. Right. Did they have like an admissions office? Some of them did get pretty close. Okay. Remember Nalanda? No, no. The renowned Buddhist monastery and center of learning we touched on earlier? Right, yeah. It was like the intellectual epicenter of its time, attracting some of the brightest minds from across Asia. Nalanda, that's the one that was compared to Harvard, right? right. So not just anyone could stroll in Bro, and snag a dorm room. Not at all. Right. We have accounts from Chinese pilgrims describing how rigorous the entrance exams were at Nalanda. Okay. Prospective students faced a barrage of challenging questions. Right. And only those who impressed the gatekeepers. Right. With their knowledge and insight were granted entry. Wow. Talk about high stakes. Yeah. It's like the ancient Indian version of acing your SATs, only with a lot more philosophy involved. But okay. what did those lucky few get to study once they were in? Mm. Was it all chanting and meditation? Well, meditation and spiritual practice were central. Okay. Nalanda's curriculum was astonishingly diverse. Okay. Students could explore everything from philosophy and logic to astronomy, medicine, even martial arts. Okay, now that's what I call a well-rounded education. Right. Monks studying alongside warriors. That's a fascinating mix. It is. Makes my history classes back in the day seem a little one-dimensional. Right. It, it does make you wonder what those ancient classrooms were like, doesn't it? Yeah. Unfortunately, we can only imagine. Because Nalanda, like many great centers of learning, met a tragic end. That's right. It was destroyed by invaders in the 12th century, a devastating loss for the world. It was. What a loss. Yeah. It's like the burning of the Library of Alexandria. Right. A treasure trove of knowledge lost. Yeah. But even though Nalanda is gone, right. its impact obviously didn't just vanish. Exactly. Right. Think about those Chinese pilgrims we keep mentioning. Yeah. Right. Fashian, Huanzang. Yeah. They weren't just tourists. Right. They risked their lives traveling along dangerous routes, driven by a hunger for knowledge right. to bring back Buddhist texts and teachings to China. Talk about dedication. I know. They were like the ancient world's knowledge smugglers, yeah. except instead of sneaking in contraband, they were bringing back the gift of wisdom. And that gift had a ripple effect. Yeah. Their journeys, their meticulous translations of Buddhist texts right. played a crucial role in spreading these ideas throughout East Asia, right. where they flourished and evolved. It really highlights how interconnected our world has always been, mm. even centuries ago. Yeah. It's easy to forget that in our age of instant communication. It's a powerful reminder that ideas have always transcended borders. Right. And it all circles back to this fundamental human desire yeah. that we've been tracing throughout this deep dive. Okay. The search for meaning, All right. for understanding our place in the universe. Yeah. It's something that connects us across cultures and time periods. So as we emerge from this deep dive into ancient India, yes. what are some key takeaways you hope our listeners will carry with them? I hope they come away with a sense of awe 
at the enduring power of ideas. Okay. The teachings of the Buddha, Mahavira, the wisdom embedded in the Upanishads, these weren't just answers for ancient India. Right. They offer frameworks for grappling with the fundamental challenges of being human, yeah. dealing with suffering, seeking meaning, and recognizing our interconnectedness. It's like they provide a roadmap for navigating not just ancient India, but the complexities of our modern world as well. Precisely. It's amazing. And that brings us to a final thought-provoking question for our listeners to ponder. Okay. How do these ancient teachings resonate with you? Okay. What wisdom can you glean from them as you navigate your own unique journey? Those are some big questions to leave our listeners with. They are. But hopefully they'll spark further reflection and maybe even inspire some to learn more. There you go. So from both of us, thanks for joining us on this fascinating deep dive into ancient India. Thanks for having me.